Um, now, my name is Solitaire Townsend. I'm the co-founder and chief solutionist uh, of Futera. And I'm a little bit intimidated to turn to my right because I have such an amazing panel here that I'm actually sort of a little bit fuzzy in my own head about uh, multi-solving for permacrisis. Now, those who know me and know that I switch between being a communicator whose job is to simplify and to focus and to put things in the language um, that everyone can understand and to not do any of the sustainability complex crap. And then the <laughs> other side of me is like an uber geek who wants to like dive into the minutiae of policy and science. And so um, I'm afraid the title, multi-solving for, multi for permacrisis, is no one's fault except mine. <laughs> none of these ladies, oh got, got, none of these ladies got a, got a choice about it. But um, I'll say why I picked that title and why I wanted um, to bring these speakers together. Because we are in a permacrisis. Like mm. who hasn't felt like there is just crisis upon crisis upon crisis out there in the world and, so, and in our own lives, of course. COVID, poverty, war, climate change, it is unfucking relenting again and again and again. And just when you think you're going to catch a break and catch a, catch a breath, then suddenly something else comes along and you're like, I, I, I can't even remember the list anymore of all the things which are going on. A century of permacrisis. And this permacrisis is complex and it's interconnected and arguably it's all coming from the same sources and from the same, shall we say, um, meta problems underneath. Mm. But too often the way in which we try to solve this permacrisis is by separating each little bit off into boxes and going... We need to work on carbon over here, we need to work on poverty over here, we need to work on COVID over here, we need to work on injustice over here, we need to uh, work, it, work on equity over here and politics over here. And actually, we are facing a, a multidimensional and completely interconnected problem, and we're trying to solve it in the, the most uh, uh, siloed way imaginable, um, which even here at Climate Week this week, we're beginning to see people beginning to put the words together, talking about things like environmental injustice in one. Um, and so that's where the multi-solving side of this comes from. Because if you've got a permacrisis, which is multiple, interconnected, and, and ongoing, you have to have a way of solving it, which is not fighting one fight at a time. You have to have a big ass plan about how you're going to try to solve it all at the same time and how solving one thing solves something else and solves something else. These guys are laughing because I'm just swearing so much. It's but actually because I thought it was Hunter, not you, because typically she drops the F exactly. word and the A word about 20 million exactly. times. Exactly. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, it's Thursday and climate week. That, like, it's, it's okay, like, you're amongst good well. company, I'm Sally. Good you're company. amongst also, good company. Also, it's, it's cute when British people swear, I've been told in America. It just sounds sweet in our, in our, la in our language. Fuck, you fuck, know, fuck. <laughs> um, you can leave that in the video. Um, uh, so, so, for this issue of going, we have, uh, even here at Solutions House, we've talked about solutions within silos, just because that's how people's brains work. Mm. But for this panel of trying to talk about how do we multi-solve a permacrisis, I wanted to bring together some of the people who are thinking in this way and who have been thinking in this way for a long time about actually how, how do we multi-solve all of our problems at once. And so we have got Sandrine Dixon, the president of the Club of Rome. Yeah. We have got um, Hunter Lovins, who I've just been told has added a seventh job title. <laughs> so um, uh, so uh, I will make sure that the one job title that I've got written down right, I'm uh, pronouncing right, which is Natural Capitalism Solutions, which yeah. is yeah. the one we bothered, to, we bothered to write down. And then we, um, we have the most wonderful Lisa Witter, who's the co-founder of A Political, who is either going to tell us that politics is the answer or is not, <laughs> so, <laughs> dep depending, on, depending on where we are. And so what I'm going to ask is, um, is I'm going to come to each of you um, and ask you right now, on a scale of 1 to 10, where are we in actually solving, multi-solving this versus sort of um, silo-solving? So if, if, if one is we are only silo solving and 10 is, no, actually as a movement we're beginning to multi-solve, I think, I think we're putting, oh no, actually as a 10 is we are multi-solving. 
Where, I'm going to come to you first, Sandrine. Where do you think we are? We're only silo-solving, or are we multi-solving? So I think the question is, who's we? Ah, great. Um, if it was those who are truly involved in the complexity of trying to find the solutions, I actually say, would say we're getting much better at multi-solving. We're collaborating a lot more. We're trying to look at the social, environmental, and economic impacts of different situations. We're trying to bring in different stakeholders. We're looking at the shift between just thinking about the national and thinking about the local. Um, and we're also, by the way, thinking a lot about how does the me fit within the we. So within that context, I think we're doing pretty damn well, except we still haven't been able to bring it to scale or to the speed that we need. Now, if we go into our political architecture, and I know Lisa will come back with some, some other <laughs> answer, but I do think we're, we're pretty aligned on this. Political slowly architecture. <laughs> yeah, we are slowly getting there. Economic architecture, financial architecture, those silos are not in a multi-solving space. And that's really where we need to up the bar and bring the actors at that level, so international, UN, all the way through to governments, regional governance, the multilateral development banks, all of them have to start thinking much more about multi-solving and systems approaches. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Hunter, zero, ten? Three. Three. I was going to okay. say the same. Right. About okay. three. About three. Um, uh, do you want to maybe uh, tell us a bit of a story about the three, or is it just a definitive <laughs> answer? <laughs> Again, it depends who we are. Yeah. Yeah. If you talk the we out there on the street, one. Yeah. Mm. If you talk the kind of people who come to a, a meeting like this, probably seven, eight. Mm. We are beginning to learn to work together. My old boss, David Brower, used to say, when the environmental movement's in trouble, it circles the wagons and shoots in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are our own best yes. enemies, mm -hmm. and the evil ones sit out there smiling. Yeah. Because we tear ourselves apart. Mm -hmm. One, we got to quit that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two, we've got to build solutions at the speed of trust, mm -hmm. which is something we've never been any good at. That means considering the existential discipline of shutting the fuck up <laughs> and listening. Second fuck up. <laughs> and listening to the people who have existential concerns. Mm -hmm. You know, a third of Pakistan's underwater right now. Uh, Puerto Rico is underwater and without power. Mm -hmm. What is it, a third of a billion people right now are starving to death. And those people have a very different story than we do about what the permacrisis is and how mm -hmm. to begin to solve it. So we need to listen to those stories and then together craft solutions that, in the words of the great Amelia Reddy, take care of the concerns of the poor first. If you do that, everything else solves itself. Yeah. We take care of the concerns of the 1%, yeah. and then nothing gets solved. So start at the bottom. Start with those who aren't in the conversation. The solution, for example, to how do you implement regenerative agriculture is you empower women. What do women have to do with agriculture? They're not the farmers. Yeah, well, they're the ones who get the farmers to actually start making changes. This is the work of Vijay Kumar in India, who has uh, tripled income for the landless farmers and the farmers on uh, a hectare or less by starting by empowering the women, building circles of women's self-help groups who then are able to work with the farmers in the community, identifying the champion farmers. VJ gets government funding to train them to become the communicators to other farmers, has gone from a few thousands to now millions across India and tripled their income production with no chemicals, no machines, and taking the science that came from, for example, Gabe Brown in the Dakotas, adding four more principles that are indigenous to India, and now is rolling it out with folk like Million Belay in Africa. Mm -hmm. So solutions, we've got lots of them. What we have lacked heretofore is the capacity to learn how to get them implemented 
in ways that that really stick. Yeah. Thank you so very much. Uh, wow. I get, I'm going to come to Lisa. Lisa, zero, ten, don't like the question. No, no, I like the question a lot. Um, I want to start off with swearing, though, because yeah. I think this is really important, this swearing question, because there's research that shows that when they did this test about putting your hand in water, um, the people who swear before they put their hand in ice water are able to have more resilience to keep their hand in ice water. And so I, I love I this think study. As we, I think as we go through this work, figuring out how to have personal resilience and have our communities have yeah. personal resilience, which maybe we need to make a new swear word that's like the swear word that everyone says that still feels a little nasty and dirty. Yeah. So we, that's, let's come up with Trump. that on the side. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's going to help us win elections, yeah. but um, we can talk about that in politics. I, I am, um, I want to give, I would say a two. And I want to give ourselves a break a little bit on this because the reason why it's so hard is because it is so hard, meaning, the brain, my background's in brain and behavioral science, right? So what the brain likes to do is break down things into its smallest unit. Mm -hmm. Not to mention most of us have come from an expertise culture, right? A culture where the experts have the power versus the experience has the power. Yeah. And I, I wrote a little book about this at one point to look at how, how, how you actually can think about how to bring, bring these things together. So it hurts our brain, which is maybe why we need to put our hand in the ice water and swear, it hurts our brain to think about system stuff. So I don't think we all have to multi-solve all the time. Hmm. I think it's fine if some people are in their lanes. We just need enough of us multi-solving. Yeah. And I, if you ask me later, I can tell you about how government's doing that in really interesting ways that needs to be um, spotlighted, uh, replicated, and maybe even praised to do it more. Oh, I love this. Um, and oh, you mentioned the word system change there. And rather than saying system change for permaquest, I use multi-solving because I almost found the word system change yeah. almost too big mm. yep. as a terminology. Mm. Whereas multi-solving sounds like if I put this together with this together with this together with this together, maybe I could do it. It feels like more of an active mm. terminology rather than system change where I'm like, uh, okay, revolution, which very well might be one of the, um, the solves. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Revolutions like hurt women and the poor yeah. Yeah. and intellectuals, which I would put all of us in this room as. Yeah. That's yeah. not an what answer. Yeah. No, and I actually I'm, I'm thinking of the pain point because I think um, looking at the way in which we deal with the complexity, we drive ourselves as far away from the pain as possible. And we can talk about then yeah. what happens with politicians because clearly sometimes those that don't have the bravery or if we're going to add another swear word or bad innuendo, we could say the balls, mm. to do what's right will run away. Yeah. And I am, and Lisa and I have talked about this, I am absolutely dumbstruck by the new law in San Francisco, which you and I talked about as well, where we can now steal up to $1,000 and not be thrown into prison or taken in. Now, for me, and I know the problem is that we have too many prisoners, and there, there is a rationale to that, but the, but the fact is, it doesn't look at the pain. Yeah. The pain is that we have homelessness, heroin addicts, and, and I grew up in San Francisco. My pain, when I go back to San Francisco, is to see how, actually, my party, the Democrats, have destroyed the most beautiful city by some kind of politically correct bullshit and not thought through what is happening to the city alongside the greatest innovators of the world. Yeah. Because we have got the greatest digitalization, all of the investment in high tech in California, none of it has trickled down in order to create the structures that we need to stop the poverty that is actually the social tipping points that is becoming the demise of San Francisco. So I really like that pain analogy yeah. because yeah. I actually think it's, it's this fear of confronting the pain. Yeah. Um, okay, so mind blown already. We're like five minutes in. <laughs> um, uh, so let's stick with the pain for a minute because the pain is the pain of acknowledging the problem, but the pain is also the pain of actually thinking through the multi-solve, mm. of actually being able to sit there and go, no, I'm not just going to do this thing and feel satisfied because I pulled this thing off. I'm going to force myself to think about how, it, how, how the work that I'm doing renewables 
affects equity, how it affects mm. supply chains and rare earths. I'm going to think about the work that I'm doing renewables, who's funding it, who gets to benefit from it, where, the, where are the communities that do it. I'm going to be thinking about this multi stuff. And it can become so overwhelming so quickly. You do need to probably sit there with your massive piece of paper and go, bah, 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 <laughs> as, as, you're, as you're planning it out. Um, so I think this is a, it, it's both the pain of confronting the problem, mm. but also how painful it is to think about multi cells. Mm. Um, and something I'm going to go back to you um, to talk a little bit about Earth for All. Mm. Because in Earth for All, that must have been quite a painful <laughs> process because you have put in there a vision of multi self and, and a connection. Lisa were laughing because they were there. So clearly, this was not a walk in the park. But, sorry, so, sorry, I just want to say that. I just have to say, yeah. one way to see this is fuck, 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 fuck. And the other is yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay, I and agree. I just, one of the things about being Climate Week this week, sorry to, to no, disrail it. I'm just, I am, I keep thinking about what if we haven't lived our best life yet? What is the opportunity mm. of progress? How can the next, you know, 20, 30, you need the pain and the gain. Mm. Yeah. And I just, I'm trying to, in my work, bring the pain and the gain yeah. together yeah. because I like pain. I mean, I love working out. If you work out because you get pain, because, but only because you get the gain. So yeah. I just, I'm trying to, this is just for myself, how you bring this together so that it's not, so you don't have cognitive dissonance, which I think is a lot that's going on. Don't yeah. look up. It's like, I just can't even think about this yet. So anyway, yeah. yes, no, yes, no, yes, yes, the, yes, 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 yes. So yes, let's, yes. let's yes. shift to the yes, yeah. yes, yes, and let's say no pain, no gain, yeah. which is exactly what we need. The Earth for All process was absolutely thinking through all of that potential multi-solving, yeah. but the systemic approach, all of those different levers that you have to pull and the different impacts. So system dynamic modeling, I'm not going to get into the the definition of what it is, but the modelers, including Jurgen Randers from the original team that did the limits to growth in 1972, plotted out in a 21st century, what is it that we have to, what are those levers that we need to pull? Yeah. And what if we don't do it fast enough, which is the too little, too late scenario, and what if we actually do it fast enough, which is the giant leap scenario? So it is giving a vision, which is yeah. super important, but it's not bullshitting us. It's yeah, saying, yeah. okay, getting from the too little, too late to the giant leap, there's going to be some pain in there. Yeah. And, and that's okay because yeah. we need to go through that process. But most importantly, it says the vision is beautiful. It's a well-being economy. It's where women are empowered. It's where we actually have finally understood that poverty and inequity are what is drawing us all down. All those wealthy people that are in San Francisco are getting the hell out of San Francisco now. Why? Because they don't want to walk by a bunch of heroin addicts. Yeah. But they're the ones that put up the housing prices in the first place. So it starts to look and unpack all that multi-solving, all that complexity, and think through, okay, what is that vision of the future? Yeah. An honest vision where we say to ourselves, our economy is broken, most of the world is not doing well, we're actually sick, and so is our planet, but we can get better. Yeah. And the medicine is a little bit of pain, but a lot of gain, which is a well-being future that actually takes into consideration more people, is more equitable, and we have a strong state, not an authoritarian state, but a strong state with a really active citizenship and democracy that functions for an earth for all. That's the beauty. Now, where was the pain? bringing together people like Hunter <laughs> and all of those unbelievable thought leaders and modelers who all have this theory of change and telling them, guys, multi-solve, yeah. collaborate, can we please have one vision yeah. and bring all that together and that's the achievement. So I'm so proud. Actually, that's what I think the pain is. The pain is the having to think it through. In many ways, I think most of this is gain. When you think about things such as, um, Lowering our meat intake, and you know that the, the massive. No. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Lowering the intake of industrial meat, of industrial increasing meat. the meat intake of regenerative meat. Absent grazing animals on the ground, we will not solve the climate crisis. We got a rancher here. Yeah, I remember, be I remember. I remember. I um, remember. Uh, but so many of, particularly the lifestyle changes that um, that we talk about. Uh, in the behavior change session that we had earlier and you start going through them and the carbon that you save and then you start going oh healthier 
longer mm. lived, more time, uh, uh, less mental health issues, walking more, more time with my kids, better sleep. And you go, yeah, let's stop talking about climate change and just start talking about how much better exactly. these lives these lives are. So I agree with you. Actually, the the outcome is all gain, but for whatever reason, the mm. thinking about it and the planning for it is is painful because that's not how human beings are built. It depends in part who you are and whose pain. Ah. Mm. A lot of yeah. the people on the right yeah. know exactly what pain they are going to suffer as we make this transition. There are something like eight million auto mechanics. Mm -hmm. As we make the transition away from internal combustion engines to EVs, EVs have 20 moving parts, ICE engines have 2,000. Mm -hmm. Who fixes ICE cars? It's not the kind of people who sit in this room. They're out of work. What are they going to do? They know damned well they're out of work, yeah. and so they oppose the transition. Yeah. Most climate deniers know the science better than most climate mm -hmm. advocates, and they know exactly how it's going to change their fossil fuel intense lifestyle. And they don't want that. So mm -hmm. there need to be some honest conversations about who wins, who loses, a well-being economy, most of the climate deniers don't want that. They're very happy, thank you, living the high consumptive life they have, mm. and they want to keep doing it. Mm. Now, happily, most of them will die off in the not distant future. <laughs> Unhappily, we don't have time for wait, to wait for that right. die off. And then you get into scenarios like uh, Stan Robinson. How many of you have read Ministry for the Future? It's great. Yeah. Mm. Go read it. It's not fun. Uh, I was talking to a colleague who said, I'm reading it in homeopathic doses. <laughs> <laughs> and it starts out with a massive die-off in India. Millions Very of people. Very similar to what we've just lived. Yeah. Guess what? You know, the book is set 20 years in the future. It's yeah. COP 43, I believe. Yeah, it's already here. That's yeah. the way that you figure out when the book is actually set. Yeah. Just about everything he's talking about is happening now. Yeah. It's like, ah. But one of the things that happens is young people start killing off the corporates who fly around in private jets. We're very close to seeing climate violence as people who realize that this is their future that we are compromising say, all right, done. I don't like you, go away. So I think that's one of the reasons why we're having this panel, because as you so rightly said, revolutions actually don't serve, and they, and they, and they tend to uh, uh, affect most negatively those who are already being affected most negatively through the, by this. So I'm actually going to come to Lisa, to government, mm -hmm. because uh, actually here at Solutions House, we, we did have a session um, on exponential policy where we were talking about how do you actually bring about the multi-solving mm -hmm. policies. But um, for so many conversations about climate, they tend to like sort of die at the government conversation because everyone talks about it being needed yeah, and then mm -hmm. there isn't a second half of the And sentence. business will solve all of our problems. Exactly. I've never been on a panel where I've been blocked by seeing the others by cowboy hats. Really, <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a first for me. I know. No, I love it. I love it. I, I, no, no, I love it. This is like this is so cool. It's like an amazing woman Try seeing it at 4 o'clock in the morning when she joins a Zoom call and she's got her <laughs> cowboy hat on. It's a whole on. new experience for well, me. It's, it's what, noon for y'all? Oh, it's know, four in the morning for me. I'm going to bridge, bridge the government yeah. from Spotted Owls. I know that seems like a weird thing, but it's, it's, it's really speaking to me right now in San Francisco. Hmm. I know it seems like a weird thing, but I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. My mom made toilet paper for 45 years. She said she works hers off so you could wipe yours. Um, <laughs> literally, she was a bar up. She worked there and now has 30% lung capacity because she has so much chard um, in her lungs. So COVID's been an interesting time with her oxygen bottle now. My dad worked at a heavy machinery diesel mechanic and they, they provided the, the machinery to cut the trees down. And a bunch of environmentalists came in and said, we have a spotted owl, you have to quit doing your work. They stopped everything. And I just remember as a kid thinking to myself, how can an owl be more important than my family? Mm -hmm. And I'm late to environmentalism because of that. Because I felt like they didn't care about my family. These elite people mm -hmm. didn't care about my family. And I keep thinking about, you know, you look at communities like San Francisco or Argentina. I was just talking to a young, very amazing man who wants to set up a political training academy. It's part of what we yeah, do. Massimo. 
and in his town in Argentina. And he's like, well, I don't think we can do this right now because we have a narco trade everywhere. And it's kind of hard because we have, and so he's going back to school to get a PhD to deal with narco trade. And the reason why people steal isn't just because and why they join narco trades. I know this seems like a non sequitur, but it's really important to this work, mm -hmm. is because they steal because they need money. But the bigger reason they steal is they don't have a sense of belonging. Exactly. And this is where I think at the heart of multi-solving, it's solving for a sense of peace that I belong to something. And I keep, I didn't want an asteroid to come. I wanted a, what will turn out to be a benevolent alien to come and have us all get our shit together. So let me talk about, that's, that's not gonna happen. I just really care about these families who, it's not that easy. It's not enough to like, I'll be retrained. This is like fundamental to our sense of pride and well-being, and we have to love these people through it. We gotta get down and get out of the way and really listen. I'm just very, very um, focused on that. Now on the government piece, I mean, the, I will give you some examples. So. I co-founded a company called Apolitical. We're a peer-to-peer -peer learning network for people in government. And breaking down these boundaries and thinking about multi-solving is, is when you ask them what's one of the most important things they can do, they say, we want to break down those boundaries mm -hmm. or silos. They've even named themselves. There's a bunch of people. This woman, Thea Snow, she's probably watching amazing. She calls herself a boundary spanner. So instead of breaking things down, she, she's a boundary spanner, right? This like, this is what I do. And now more and more governments are putting, I know this is super geeky, but they're putting coordinating ministers or coordinating roles. So that's a first start. Like how do you structurally change the way a government works? Amazing examples of how this has been done to advance early childcare, which isn't about kids. It's about our whole society, yeah. right? Mm. The other trend I'm seeing is a multi-solving approach. They don't call it like that, but if you look at 15 minute cities, which is really about climate, but it's not just about climate. Why? Because you have a sense of belonging if you know your neighborhood. If all of the, within 15 minutes of your radius, if you can get your kids to school, you can find a police office, you can get your, your healthy groceries, this is multi-solving at its best sense. And so I feel like one of the things we need to be doing, same with, there's another great example called Urban 95. So how do you take a 95 centimeter, which is the average age of a three-year-old, and make all your policies around to this. Like, go to the little person, you look at it, their view. That's environmental, mm -hmm. that is um, sense of belonging, that health. is education, that is health, that is everything. And policymakers can get their, their ideas around this their, their, and their constituents because there's something in it for everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we, I don't even know what I am, inside or out today, I don't even know, it doesn't matter. But we've been like, we need to do this, and it's like this, and then we need to do that. And when you're a politician or a government, there's only so much bandwidth that you have to solve problems, because you have political will, you have little time, you've got to bring people along. And there's a fight for whoever has the loudest voice, because you could literally, the brain can only take so much load. So I feel like I know amazing people in government, in politics, that want to give me a multi-solving thing, help me like bring the constituencies, help me sometimes when it's not gonna be perfect for everyone here, yeah. that they're gonna be like, it's not perfect for me. Okay, but we have to move this forward. Yeah. We need to be supporting governments when they get it right, feed the good wolf in them. Support the politicians when they get it right. I'm not saying perfect, but get it right, feed the good wolf in them. And I'm seeing momentum and I'm particularly seeing it with female politicians because mm. I love men too. I have one, several of them, they're great. <laughs> just the data shows that women, women are, this is just fact, when you look at who is being the steward inside mm. of government and politics right now, it's female politicians. And I just, back to this brain work, I think it's because the way our brains were wired a bit, again, we can talk about essentialism, all of this, but we have a multi-solving approach because our proximity is in a multi-solving way. So I'm quite bullish, as you guys know, on the possibility. And I think going around saying how bad government is all the time, really, is that inspiring? Oh, you're bad. Are you gonna come to the table and work with me because you're bad? Yeah, I really wanna go to that party, the bad party. Why don't we take them to the good party yeah. and help them? Yeah. That's what Dave Brower said. If you wanna have change, throw a better party. Yeah, yeah. yeah. agree. Yeah. Agreed. Which I gather y'all are gonna yeah. do this we're evening. Do the well, thing. We're, we're off the giving same. bloody exactly. speeches. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, we'll come back, we'll come back. We'll come back. It, 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 it will keep going. So um, <laughs> th there, was, there was something that, that you said there about multi-solving. Thank you so much mm. for giving so many great examples of multi-solving as well.
um, around something being in it for everyone. But also the fact that we know that a great compromise is when everyone is a bit annoyed. Yeah. So like you know you've had a great compromise when everyone feels like they're the one who made the most compromise. Um, so you know, could, could we, it sounds crazy to talk about trying to simplify down multi-solving, but is there a couple of principles of multi-solving when there's something in it for everybody, but actually everybody also has to give something up? That there's a sense of belonging um, and that actually, you know, if you start at the 35 uh, inches, that's when you're going to be thinking. Is this a, because I'm just thinking we've got a big audience here, um, uh, here and, and online, who who we want to give them some skills of multi-solving whilst 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 we finish out this session. So you've just been through this huge multi-solving exercise with Earth oh. for All, which people really must go take a look at the website and buy the book. Um, uh, oh, uh, uh, but buy ten copies of the book, give it to all your <laughs> friends and family. This is a great Christmas present. Um, uh, well, no, good, what better Christmas present? Than that? This is how we save the world. Uh, so, so having gone through that process, uh, you know, what what were some of the skills of multi-solving that that you developed that others could learn from? So I, maybe I'll just bring in some personal experience yeah. because I really have tried to build a little bit like Lisa actually my career around multi-solving and bringing different stakeholders together and building bridges. And I think the number one skill is humility, which comes back to your point. Yeah. Leave your friggin' ego out the door and tell everyone else to do the same. In fact, it's what I say. I open the conversation and say whoever I'm with, CEOs, presidents, whoever, this is a non-ego party. We're going to be here and everyone's going to have to give. And we are going to get so much more from that process. And I think if you start with a level of humility and you already create that from the outset, and it, it works with the oil and gas sector, it works with all of the big, bad, supposedly baddies yeah. that in the end turn out to be goodies. And I've done this in Russia where at the end of the day we're drinking vodka together and you realize that all they want to talk about is their mother. And that starts a conversation around oil. Yeah. You don't start by saying you've really fucked things up by yeah. being part of the extractive economy and really there are people dying because you're doing this. Instead, you start talking about their mother, you actually warm things up, and then you get to the big issue. But so I think, I mean, I'm joking, but I do yeah. think it's all often, and that's why also women who have a little bit more of that emotional intelligence can start those conversations and often are amazing facilitators. I also think that having worked with the oil and gas sector and across the globe, I so discovered, for me it was the biggest eye opener, there are good people everywhere. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right, Lisa. There are people that are working in oil and gas companies in Brazil, at Petrobras, et cetera, that are doing that because it was the best engineering job that they could get. So turning them into stewards, which most of them were already, using that engineering brain around innovation, I think the biggest issue as well is to remind people that they're alive, yeah. that they question rather than being complacent. We've gotten so dumbed down in so many ways. I mean, that pain, that's part of the beauty of living. And why is it that we think that instead we've got to inject ourselves with all of this supposedly feel good material bullshit? We don't. And I think if you get to that level, and you can do it with Everyone, because at the end of the day, everybody has a mother, most people do, or a father, or kids. It's bringing it back down to the basics. So you use that as the entry point. Then you build from there. And I think building from there is getting to people where they are, yeah. understanding. So what should happen, those stupid environmental spotted owl fanatics, what they should have done is really start to talk to the community about how the community could have actually protected the spotted owl. Leave some of those trees up or figure out other ways. But don't just immediately come in, create some kind of animosity, but instead build that. That's what just transition is all about. It's not about going to the mining towns and saying we're closing down the mines and sorry for you, but basically this is going to be a much better world for everyone except for you. Yeah. It's actually going in there saying, we're going to build up your community, we're going to innovate in a different way, and most of the miners actually don't want their kids to work in a mine. So I think it's being smart, going in, going in with a lot of humility as you do it. 
I love this. So we've got we've got humility. We've got what is it actually feeling really challenging for us and having to overcome our own prejudices mm. when we're talking to other people um, and being able to actually start with where people are. Hunter, skills for multi-solving. Assume you're wrong, <gasps> and then test for that. We all assume we're right and try to prove it. This mm. is uh, the dicta from Alan Savory. Yeah. Look for where you might be wrong and try to correct it before mm. it becomes a disaster. Yeah. That's and such a big one in our sector. At 4 o'clock, I've got to be on a yeah. uh, <laughs> Zoom call with yeah, the New York Power Authority, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to... Bid you all farewell, and where am I going? You are going towards the back, and Mapem will lead you. Perfect. Okay, but I, I want to hear what Lisa has to say yeah. in terms of skills for multi-solving. So, um, I'm going to miss the hat, though. Yeah, um, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, I think, number one, maybe not all of us have to be multi-solvers. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you have something and you're in it, just be really good at that. Because I think asking everyone to do this is like, no, there are some people, like, have, have your lane. Like, know about it, but have, have your lane. But, the fundamental question I'm having about all of this right now, Climate Week has really messed with my head a little bit because we don't have time. Mm. Yeah. And we can't scale you drinking vodka everywhere. So um, my question is, I would have answered that question. I think a lot about Otto Sharma's theory U. Mm. So you're listening for disagreement, you're listening, you know, and then you listen all around to listen to co-creation. And I want to go around and do participatory everything with everyone. I don't think we have time. Yeah. And I don't know how to feel about it. I don't have an answer to that. But the one thing I do know is I just want to talk about this, this being wrong. I think the breakthrough I've had that I'm still trying to figure out is being OK with being wrong about it and getting over the shame of really fucking up and not paying attention to this yeah. sooner. Mm. And just going like we, we're in a we're in a learning mode. We're going to do this together. But I really have a question for everyone. Like we don't. I'm trying to balance my love for democracy mm. and my desire to make sure that humans have democracy because yeah. we have humans. And I I haven't figured that out. And I I know you and I think about I this. And I just I'm worried about that. I yeah. haven't figured it out. So if anyone has any answers, yeah. if I can give you a word of. Uh, uh, of comfort, I don't think any of us have got it figured out, and that's okay right now, because to use the analogy that you started, we're going to have to plunge our hands into that ice water of the permacrisis, screaming, yes, 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 <laughs> as we try to find those solutions, yeah. and that perhaps we're at the point where this isn't the point where actually we have to have all the answers, we only have to have answers, but we don't have to have all of them. And so just plunge your hands into the ice water, scream yes, 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 and try to put the multi-solves together. I'm going to say thank you so very much to Hunter, who is now on her call to multi-solving, to Sandrine, for the enormous work that, that the Earth Wall is, um, which is the, the most incredible um, uh, follow-on from uh, Limits to Growth. And like, honestly, we're going to remember Earth Wall far longer than we remembered Limits to Growth. Yeah. And, uh, and, and to Lisa for the incredible work that she's doing in this sector around uh, politics that so many of us consider so important and yet are so scared of. So thank you so, so very much. Multi-self of permacrisis. We can do it. Thank you.